The J&J &J vaccine is here. It's different. Health experts say that's not bad. They're looking to bust myths about it, while Denver's Catholic leaders urge people to avoid that vaccine. Colorado is giving out shots on the honor system, which leaves an opening for people who are completely devoid of honor and self-respect. We'll talk about that. Plus, there's a plan to stick fewer people in jail if they're accused of nonviolent crimes. In the middle of a spike in crime, is that the time to do that? And impending white doom! Denver, brace for a trace! Or in the mountains and plains, we'll have team coverage of other topics because you've seen snow before and this is next. The arrival of the J&J &J vaccine in Colorado this week feels different. There's probably a few reasons for that, right? It's not the first vaccine to get here. That was a special moment. It's not the one that the most vulnerable in Colorado will get because that, that's already happened. This vaccine works differently than the other, so that's created some questions and it's had a similar but not the same impact on the virus in research. Public health experts are fielding a lot of questions about this vaccine. They were happy to share answers with our Anusha Roy. We took the same set of questions to four hospital systems, Denver Health, UC Health, SEL Health, and Health One, and they all said the same thing. They are medically equivalent. I promise they're medically equivalent. Dr. Zane with UC Health gets it. At first look, that's confusing. It's hard not to ask a question when you read that Pfizer and Moderna are 94 and 95. And the Johnson and Johnson numbers don't match at surface level. But Dr. Zane said they're focused on what matters most. The important thing is severe disease, hospitalization and death, and they're all equivalent excellent vaccines. So why the number discrepancy? Every doctor we talked to said you can't make a direct comparison between the vaccines. Each vaccine trial took place during different times of the year and in different geographic regions. When Johnson & Johnson was doing, were doing their phase three trials, we had in circulation a lot more of these variant strains. There's some differences in reported equivalency for mild disease, but again, that's differences for mild disease, uh, and they were studied at different times in different parts of the world. Also, mild symptoms are easier to handle, and when the doctors looked at how each individual vaccine worked for the really important things, like saving lives and keeping people out of the hospital, they said all three worked really well. Because developing vaccines in a year during a pandemic was a historic and momentous scientific achievement, we wanted to report that they were 94% effective. And then when the trials came out for Johnson & Johnson, just the fact that they were different uh, made the news. And unfortunately, the news was not contextual. So obviously this is also a one dose shot easier to store, which the doctors are really excited about. And a lot of the hospitals and the state said that you, they're going to start working in all of this information into one on one conversations, FAQs online. Health One's even looking into putting together a guide that people can read through. And just to give you a quick update, the Johnson and Johnson vaccines have started showing up in Colorado. The state is expecting the number of this specific vaccine to go up later this month, Kyle. The news was not contextual, Anusha. That was probably our fault. We should try to do better next time. Uh, speaking of, uh, there are going to be people, for one reason or another, we'll touch on religious objections in just a little bit, who feel like they want to pick one vaccine or the other. Hey, people even knowing ahead of time, if I go to this clinic, what am I going to get there? Yeah, you know, and honestly, Kyle, just like what you were talking about, this conversation helped me understand, you know, the numbers behind Johnson and Johnson better. And all of the hospital systems that we talked to today said, in general right now, you can't really pick what vaccine you're going to be getting through them, right? It's just going to be based off of availability. Denver Health said specifically for them, they only have one vaccine at a clinic site because they don't want things to get mixed up. And they want people to pick things off of appointment availability and care can you get there not based off of what vaccine is being offered? I just heard from the state a couple of minutes ago. They said through them that you will know what vaccine is being offered at a site when you're signing up for it for that vaccine. But again, they want people to sign up based off of eligibility and not just scrolling through and seeing what vaccine is being offered there because they are very excited that all three of them are going to be coming online. That's the reason why we've why we've shifted the timetable forward is because of this vaccine coming into the pipeline. All right, Anusha, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
alluded to this a moment ago, Catholics in Colorado are being urged by church leaders to avoid that J&J &J vaccine if they can. The Denver Archdiocese is telling Catholics to get the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine if they are able to choose. All three of the vaccines were developed using cells that were long ago derived from aborted fetuses. That is the church's concern. But the way that they're handling this is the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines used fewer of those cells. So they're calling the Johnson & Johnson vaccine morally compromised. This mirrors the stance that we've seen from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops as well as the Vatican. There are 966,000 Colorados who have now gotten their first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. That is almost 17% of our state's population. 9% of our state's population is now fully immunized. Hospitalizations. They're at the lowest they've been since the second week of October. 314 patients currently. We finally got another one-day jump that we'd been lacking for a little while. Dropped 97 patients from the day before, down 60 from this time last week. The percentage of tests coming back positive, the indicator of how prevalent the disease is in the community, that's remained pretty flat over the last couple of weeks, but it's been flat in, in a good way. Yesterday was 3.1%. Our weekly average held steady at 3.3%. Tomorrow will mark one year since the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was announced in Colorado, and we're going to bring you a special hour-long edition of Next tomorrow night, starting 6, normal time, going to 7 p.m. It's going to include an address from Governor Jared Polis at 6.30 and a ceremony in remembrance of the nearly 6,000 Coloradans lost over the last year. All right, so picture this scenario. Spoiler alert, it's not great. You go outside, you're going to leave work, go wherever. Your car's gone. It's been stolen. But then, have no fear, police figure out who they think stole it. All right, so what happens next? As of now, an officer has discretion. They can arrest the suspect or they can issue a summons to appear in court later. A bill that aims to reduce jail populations in our state would limit those options. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger takes a look at an attempt to change when people suspected of a crime get arrested and when they don't. Look at this list of crimes. Murder, manslaughter, homicide, serious assaults, kidnapping, sexual assault, robbery. These are all crimes that will still result in an arrest, regardless of what happens with a bill to reduce arrests to help limit jail populations. What I'm really trying to do is to uh, wean Colorado from its incarceration addiction. The bill by Democratic State Senator Pete Lee would tell police that certain crimes are not subject to arrest, simply a summons. Certain felonies like theft, weapon possession, and get this, inciting a riot or insurrection. There are provisions in the bill which allow and empower law enforcement to arrest people if they present a risk to the community or if they are going to flee the jurisdiction. We believe this bill is anti-victim and anti-community. Corey Christensen is the police chief in Steamboat Springs, but also serves as the president of the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police, which is against this bill. Now, if your house is broken into, I cannot arrest that person. I have to issue them a summons. So the tool of discretion is being removed from my police officer who's out there working every day to keep his or her community safe. For me to help you understand which crimes would be arrest eligible and which ones would be, here's a notice that says when you need to come to court, I had to study the state's 355 page crime classification guide. Is this summons or arrest? Like, could it be confusing in the moment? It is confusing. It's not gonna, it could be, it will be. This is the size of a reference book for a police officer. Police are trained by their uh, local police administrations and you know, they're trained to enforce the law and they have arrest authority. So they darn well better know uh, the circumstances under which they can arrest a person before they take them into custody. Well, you just watched, that's just the first part of the bill. The second half talks about when someone should not have to pay a cash bond. We've talked in the past about people stuck in jail because they simply can't afford $50 to get out while they wait for their court dates. That second part of the bill says, okay, even if law enforcement arrests someone for those crimes like theft, weapon possession, break-in, that a judge won't tie their freedom to payment unless it's proven that that person will flee or threaten someone else's safety. Kyle, all that part is still being debated right now uh, at the state legislature. It's, this one's going to go all night, I think.
clearly Democrats in the state legislature are making criminal justice reform one of their top priorities. Wow, Marshall, you read the 355 pages. I am going to call you the next time I plan to do crimes. Thank you, Marshall. Will teachers and grocery store employees have to show proof of employment to get the vaccine? The state's plan and your stories of friends bragging about cutting in line early. They just wanted to protect and serve our community. No matter even if you wanted to be a fire person, the opportunity probably wasn't there at that time period because this was it. They fought for the chance to fight fires and left their mark on Colorado. Next. Tonight's next question came from a slew of you, asking if you're going to have to prove that you're eligible for the vaccine when your time comes. Will providers be asking for proof of age or your occupation or your medical condition? Or is it just the honor system? State Health Department says it's basically the honor system. I mean, once you're outside of clinics that are hosted, like at a site of employment, like a hospital or school or something like that. Now, individual employ uh, providers of the vaccine, they are allowed to ask for documentation if they choose to do so. Like the state suggested that maybe they would require a, a pay stub for an occupation-based eligibility. Anecdotally, though, you've told us that this is not happening. That you're just getting the vaccine, no questions asked. Along those same lines, we are getting some feedback asking for guidance on what to do about people you know who are weaseling their way into the vaccination system early. A viewer wrote in about a family friend who admitted lying to get a vaccine early before she went on an international trip. I hope the show does not become like Dear Abby, uh, but your email did write in and ask me about the moral question here. Uh, this person whose name I'll hold on to said, my wife and I are disgusted by her, the friend's lack of moral compass. Should we report her in some way? Concerned in Colorado, that's, I'll, that's what I'll call you, stick with the Dear Abby theme. Concerned in Colorado, here's what I would say. I think that focusing on individual people who cut the vaccine line distracts from the larger issue of vaccine inequality. Because as supply ramps up, there should be enough vaccines and the more pressing issue is gonna be getting vaccines to people in underserved communities. 
there are always going to be dishonest individuals who lack the moral courage to stay within the bounds of the system. I say let's focus our energy on the larger goal. So I guess what I, I would tell you concerned in Colorado is that she's your friend and she's only going to remain your friend if you decide that. She made her choice. Now you get to make yours. Our powerful March storm is marching over southern Colorado, bringing some beneficial moisture to the state. For some areas, it'll be rain. For others, it'll be wet, heavy snow. We have a winter weather advisory for areas west and south. The snow line is set up basically south of Denver from Castle Rock down to Colorado Springs. It's a fast moving storm moving out of south central Colorado into Oklahoma and Texas by early tomorrow morning. So we'll see three to six inches south Castle Rock to Monument Hill, Denver, a trace to about an inch on the grass and kind of a cold night when skies clear. We drop to 28 degrees tomorrow with sunshine close to 60 on a Friday and then you gotta love this extended forecast 65 to 70 degrees through the upcoming weekend and first part of next week. Yeah, absolutely. They are the pride of five points because of the history that's here. The beautiful architecture and the wonderful people of that part of Denver have been protected by a group with a rich history of its own. Next. Got a note from a viewer named Bob this week celebrating that Black History Month is over. Bob, first off, that's a racism. Secondly, this next story is for you. The story of Denver Fire Station 3. This is the heart of Five Points. You know, from here and a few blocks over and a few blocks uh, east and west. We're at 2525 Washington. Now this is the, the station Station 3 that was created in 1931. 
the equipment that we have here has changed in the last 90 years, but essentially it's the same as it was 90 years ago. And it has a very historical significance in this community. It was the first and only segregated fire station. You know, these weren't easy jobs to get. I mean, obviously, limited number of opportunities. So no matter even if you wanted to be a fire person, the opportunity probably wasn't there at that time period because this was it. So they suffered in so many ways. This is the indignity of knowing that no matter how hard you worked, no matter what you did, you weren't allowed to advance. So it's a bittersweet story. Absolutely, they are the pride of Five Points because of the history that's here and the people who still remember the fire station. Some of them actually, the families are still here. I'm a fourth generation Denverite. I'm a granddaughter of Glenn Davis, who was one of the first uh, firefighters transferred from this station, which was segregated. You could tell he felt distinguished. You know, he was always a great posture. The memories came flooding back because, you know, I would come visit my grandfather and hang out and some, I think I think I was allowed to sit in the truck, you know, and I just felt, I could feel him and I could, I just felt proud and happy. I'm grateful. Grateful for, for their resilience, grateful for their determination. That's what builds the pride, that shows the perseverance of a community and of a people. This very ground is a testament to determination, hope, faith, resilience. This very ground, that's what this ground stands for. Thanks to our photojournalist Foster Gaines for that trip to Denver Fire Station 3. Bring in some snow day fun inside. It's the most Colorado thing we saw today. That your feedback next.
the most Colorado thing we saw today are kids reinventing how to play in the snow. Like the siblings in Broomfield who put all the snow from the last storm to good use. They filled their bathtub with it and they painted it up using colored water. We got a parenting pro tip from their mom, Bree. You could use food coloring to do this, uh, but Bree finds the more economical way to do it is just to put washable markers inside the bottles and it turns the, the water colors. Again, washable markers or else you're redecorating your bathroom in rainbow. Another most Colorado nominee, Sunday day snowball fight. Foot of snow is going to last you even into 60 degree days. It sure did this week. So Caden picked up a handful and let his grandmother Susan have it right there in the middle of a sunny day. Send us the most Colorado things you see by email or on social media. Sandy writes in tonight about the Catholic Archdiocese in Denver weighing in on the J&J &J vaccine, saying, why is the Archdiocese getting involved in this? I mean, Sandy, faith and, and the tenets of faith are linked to everything in life. So it's not a surprise that they would have an opinion on this and tend to think that people who have that opinion in forefront in their lives will act on it and others won't. Life goes on. Uh, Chris R. says, please don't say that the most vulnerable have been vaccinated. My wife has two chronic conditions. She's not eligible till tomorrow. He says, looking back, should have driven her to Texas. It's a very good point. We know that there are folks who are very anxiously waiting for tomorrow's new phase.